In today's video, I'm gonna teach you how to make this type of product visualization from scratch to the final adjustments. I'm also going to include some tips that I've learned while making this project that will make your workflow definitely more faster and more efficient. Before we start, I just want to say that this is my first tutorial I ever made on YouTube, so if there are any ways I can improve my videos and my content, please let me know down in the comment section. I will be very grateful for that and since you are my viewer, it is also good for you to make my videos better by pointing on the things that can be improved. Step 1. Finding reference. References are serving as a valuable source of inspiration, allowing artists to explore different styles, compositions and techniques. You can use whatever source or website you want, but I'll be using Pinterest. The reason for that is that I always got the best results with the Pinterest algorithm. Whatever you are looking for, you will basically find it right here. Once you find all the references you need, you can use PureF to put them all in one place. It's a software that you can download completely for free, link is provided in description. This is an optional step, but I recommend using a real reference because you can explore the object from different angles, which can be actually helpful to understand the proportions, and you can also see how the object looks like under different lighting conditions. With the references ready, you can open up Blender and you can also import some image references which you can use as a hint for creating a proportionally perfect 3D model. And because accuracy is important, we need to search for the dimensions of the object that we are currently modeling. This is also an optional step, but I will recommend it. This will ensure that animation, lighting and importing models will be set accurately. Now we have to model the pen itself. For a pen object, we will start with low poly model. Then we will use a subdivision surface modifier for better resolution and at the same time still maintain the light geometry. If you want to create sharper edges, you can use either bevels or creases. I'm gonna use bevel this time because it creates a better result. With insets and extrusions, you can add additional details. And if the object has more parts, you should be following the same modeling workflow. In this case, we need to create a 3D model of the tip, of the base and of the cap of the pen. But every object has a thickness, so we will use a solidify modifier. And the rest is just repeating the cycle to the point where you are happy with your 3D model. In this case, I am creating a 3D pen model, which is actually pretty easy to make since it has a pretty defined shape. Another optional step is creating the inside. It will take you a little bit more time, but I think that it's a good practice for you in a modeling skills and techniques that can be used in future projects. As a 3D artist, you shouldn't be stuck with the reference only. So, if you have the option, try to get away from the reference picture. When your 3D model is complete, you can try to do a packaging. You can go far more creative than I did, but I think a simple box with a solidify modifier is enough. Now, when all your 3D models are ready, you can add empties as a parent object. Utilizing empties as a parent object in Blender offers a structured organization system, grouping related objects together for efficient management of complex scenes. This means that whatever transformation you are going to do to the empty, you will affect the whole collection of objects at once. The last thing to do with our model is to create a UV map. In edit mode, you will select edges that will split the object in order to unfold it properly from 3D object to 2D unwrapped map and press the right button on your mouse and click on mark seam. After that you will select the whole object with Ctrl A and press U and UV unwrap. When modeling is done we can actually create a graphic design for our product. Now if you haven't received pre-made graphic design for the product render and you know you can do the graphic design on your own you should often receive details and information that should be included in the design from your client. But my goal in this video is to show you the whole workflow step by step. So that's why I am going to create the whole graphic design on my own. So open up your favorite program. You can use whatever program you want. I'll be using Affinity Designer and Affinity Publisher. I will use my iPad instead of desktop version because for me it works better. There are several things that should be included. The most important are company name with logo, product name, product imagery, key message, product description, disclaimer, contact info and some additional information about the product. 
So to something to start with, I'm using a colors website to generate me a color palette. I recommend this page because it is quite easy to use and you will get pretty decent results in just a matter of seconds. You can use a website called Namelix. This website will generate a name for your company based on the input and keywords. For a product information and description, you can use something like JetGBT. For creating a uniform design, you have to create a precise cutout, basically an unwrapped version of your 3D object. If you are unsure about dimensions of certain parts of your object, in Blender you go to edit mode by pressing tab and in viewport overlays you will enable edge length option in measurement section. If you think that you are getting a weird results, you need to switch from local to global space. Now when you know the dimensions, you can start making a layout. And once you got all the necessary resources, you can start working on the graphic design. Remember that the graphic design is a visual representation of the product and it should be in some sense related to it. You can also try to implement some good storytelling but in this case it's not that necessary because our main goal is to create a visually attractive and powerful design. If you want some additional details that will help you to understand your client's needs more, try to be more in touch with him and ask questions like what is the nature and purpose of the product? What is the brand's identity and desired brand image? What emotions or message should be the product visualization evoking? Or something about the target audience and market. This is quite important for your workflow because by doing this you will save yours and your client's time in a way that there won't be too many revisions when you know his needs directly. I am not going to dig much deeper into the rules in graphic design because this video is about product visualization. After you are done with your graphic design, you will export two versions, but one of them will contain outlines around each side of the layout. This method will help you with the navigation of your UV map and allows you to be more precise with the mapping. So go to the shading tab, create a new material and place your graphic design as an image texture and connect it to the principled BSDF. Now you just have to align the UV map with the image texture. Once you are done, just switch the textures. Now that would be the end of the shading part for most people. But what I usually do to achieve more realistic and attractive look is applying PBR materials. In most cases you will just use a basic image texture with a principled or diffuse BSDF shader. And there is nothing wrong with it because it will almost always do the job. However, if you want to create a close-up render with additional details and in a more photorealistic style to allow the viewer to explore the render more in depth, I recommend trying this method at least once. The way I usually apply PBR materials is by using a black and white texture that can be obtained directly from an already existing graphic design texture. In this case, the black and white values will be used to separate the materials on the different parts of the design. Usually a combination of two materials is enough because with every additional material it's getting more complicated to use them together and at the same time maintaining a good looking render. First thing you need to do is to add a color ramp that will convert your design to black and white mask and will be used as a adjustable threshold for PBR materials. Then you will add one mix shader and two principal BSDF shaders. Now we need to get the actual materials. You can use whatever source you prefer, but I'm going to use Ambient CG, since it's completely free and offers high quality textures with big range of resolutions and also supports PNG and JPEG formats. I have decided to use a combination of paper and shiny silver metal. Now this may sound weird, but at the end this combination will enrich the render in a way of balancing non-reflective and reflective surface that will interact with the light and create a royal looking material. Once your download is complete, unzip the files and copy the path from the file manager. Then open up Blender again and go to the preferences and enable Node Wrangler if you haven't yet, which is a shame because this add-on will save you insane amount of time and your mental health. After that, you go to the shading tab and select one of your principal PSDF shaders. Then do Ctrl Shift T, which will open up Blender's file manager. Now you will pass the path with your materials. 
then select them all with Ctrl A and hit enter. This should automatically connect all individual image maps correctly to the shader inputs. Now do this again for your second material. After doing so, connect both principal BSDFs to the mix shader and use the black and white output of color ramp as a threshold for your materials. If your materials are in opposite order, just switch the inputs in mix shader or place an invert node between the color ramp and the mix shader factor input. Delete displacement nodes and lower your normal value to remove the insane bump level. And the last is just switching the color, diffuse or albedo map with your graphic design texture. For lighting, we will use an HDRI texture. My favorite source of HDRI textures is Polyheaven. Here you can download high quality HDRI textures with resolution up to 16K and because it is a public 3D asset library, you can download assets for free. And once you have downloaded your desired HDRI, do not import it by just dropping the file from File Manager into Shading tab. Because Blender will automatically import the environment texture as an image texture, so the HDRI won't be working properly. So you go to the Shading tab, switch from Object to World and add Environment Texture node. Then import your downloaded file and press Ctrl T to add a mapping node with texture coordinates. Now you just play with the rotation setting until you get the result you wanted. HDRI textures are very important in 3D industry, since they can provide natural lighting from multiple angles and sources, and they are a great alternative for basic lighting setup up with more realistic and stunning results. You should also try to play with multiple camera angles, distances from camera and different lenses. I recommend using focal length somewhere in range from 55 to 100 mm max. For long distance renders you should be using focal length from around 55 to 70 mm. For close up renders it's better to stick with 70 mm and above. If you decide to do close up renders you should definitely enable depth of field feature that can be found in camera properties on the right side. This effect will bring the sense of scale to the viewer and helps to separate foreground and background blurring objects that are too far and too close from the camera. This also helps a lot with creating a point of focus and supports the overall visual interest. For making the focus point more adjustable, add an empty and in depth of field select the empty as a focus object. If you enable snapping, you can move your empty freely in order to change the focus point. Environmental storytelling is a very powerful and effective way of giving a good environmental context or a backstory for your render and art in general. It typically adds some level of drama and helps the viewer to fully explore the scene. In product visualization, we can use this method for representing our product in the best way possible and place it to its natural environment. It's also useful in a way that the surroundings will help to uncover the full potential and purpose of the product being represented. For this reason I am going to recreate some sort of elegant office environment because I want my product to be visualized that way. So for assets I'm gonna use 3D Sky, which is a website that provides free models. Most of them are really high quality. Besides product visualization, I think it is also a good website for architectural visualization because this website provides a lot of furniture models which are used mostly for interior design. I will use this 3D wooden plate with abstract patterns and built-in lighting. So by now you should have a fully unwrapped 3D model textured with our label graphic design combined with PBR materials and with proper camera setup and realistic lighting. But there are a few optional steps I would personally recommend doing before hitting render. And don't worry, we need to make only a few setting adjustments. First, if you still haven't done this before, switch to Cycles Render Engine and select GPU Rendering Device. It will be in most cases a lot faster than CPU rendering and also more efficient. The only reason to use CPU rendering is if it's faster than your GPU or if you want to prevent occasional program crashing. In view layer properties, scroll down and check denoising data. By doing so, when you start rendering, it will include necessary information 
from Denoising that will help you to reduce the noise in final render. The Denoising process will start automatically if you got this feature enabled in render properties. The Denoising data are just additional information that the Denoising algorithm will use to bring you more accurate result. When we got your Denoising data enabled, go to Composing tab and make sure you have to option Use Notes enabled and plug the noisy image, albedo and normal outputs to the Denoising node inputs. Another thing is that if you feel that the contrast is too weak, go to the render properties, scroll down to the bottom and in color management section choose higher contrast than you are currently on. The next thing is choosing a format. Now you can use whatever file format that fits your or your client's preferences, but please don't render in JPEG, since there are almost always issues with artifacts due to the JPEG compression. I will use PNG with 0% of compression and 16-bit color depth. Now last but not least, a sample count. For a sample count, you can choose basically any value from 300 to 2000. This is really optional and it depends on the amount of light bounces, geometry and mainly on the materials being used. For example, if you are using a combination of metal and glass or glossy surface, you should be using higher sample count to avoid artifacts and distortions caused by the denoising algorithm. And now we are finally ready to render our scene. So press render or F12 on your keyboard and just wait until your render is finished. When rendering is done, just wait a few more seconds until the denoising algorithm takes care of the leftover noise. And congratulations, now you have your final render. For some people this would be the end of their workflow, but if you want to take the visual interest on another level with post-processing, you can use tools like Photoshop or Lightroom. But for basic composing, I will be using Blender's built-in compositor, since I'm only going to make minor adjustments, which can be also done here in Blender. First, I want to do some color correction to create a specific mood that will support the overall look and attractiveness of the product and its environment. So now in Blender Compositor, add a color balance node and play with the color wheel settings. The lift slider controls the shadows and dark values, the gamma feature controls midtones, and the gain feature controls the bright areas and highlights. I want to enhance a little warm yellow color in order to support the golden metallic material used on the product. This combination will result in a more luxurious feeling. I also want to add some level of glare effect since I am using metallic material which is highly reflective. Glare is basically an artifact caused by cheap camera lenses that appears when a camera is exposed to the strong light reflection or a bright light emitting source like sun, lamp or flashlight. This also applies for our vision because a human eye is sensitive to bright objects and glare just like a camera lens. Now in 3D programs we need to mimic these artifacts from real life to bring our render closer to photorealism. So in Blender Compositor, add a glare node, place it after the color balance and change it to fog glow. Also switch to high quality and adjust the size. And that's all! I hope you learned some valuable information that will you use to improve your renders or workflow to be more efficient and faster. And as I said at the beginning, this is my first ever YouTube video and I'm going to need some support and feedback from you to improve the quality of my videos. So if you want to share your opinion with me about this tutorial, let me know down in the comments. Thanks for watching, if you are interested in this type of content, which I am sure you are because you just watched my video. Subscribe for more tutorials, which are already in production right now, so make sure you don't miss them. See you in the next video.